Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation uh, to come and share some of our insights uh, into immunity against pandemic uh, diseases. So prior to COVID-19, you may all be aware that we have, uh, as humans, suffered a number of uh, disastrous pandemics, which have uh, um, uh, killed millions and millions of individuals. We can go back to Black Death or Bubonic Plague, which killed probably 200 million individuals worldwide. This was then followed by smallpox, which killed approximately 56 million individuals. And then, of course, influenza, HIV AIDS, uh, uh, and so forth. So we have had a number of pandemics which have wiped out millions of individuals. The history books tell us of these occurrences and they have shaped human society and our culture. More recently, of course, we have been dealing with influenza. This is a pandemic virus and the most likely source of new large outbreaks of plagues. And the reason for this lies in the biology of the virus, and we now understand why influenza is such a problem. It's because the virus can exchange genetic material between different viruses in a very efficient way. And therefore, we can generate very new types of influenza each year or every few years. And that is why human immunity struggles to keep up with these changing viruses. And therefore, we've developed pandemic virus vaccines in response. But of course, pandemics can come from unknown places. We need to be ready somehow to understand new pandemic viruses because our society's functioning depends on protecting ourselves. Nobody thought coronaviruses would cause large-scale death and destruction. But back in 2002, we noted SARS-1 emerging in East Asia. This only killed around 800 people, but caused very, very significant panic worldwide. Of course, in the Middle East, we saw MERS emerging, which also caused a lot of panic and fear because of the high mortality of this coronavirus. And then, of course, COVID-19, which we do not really need to discuss. Its impact was so far reaching. So pandemic risks are ongoing. We are interfacing with uh, bats, with animals all the time, encroaching on their wildlife. We are studying these viruses in very safe conditions. So lab leaks are very uncommon and very rare and low probability. But of course, uh, seafood markets, uh, sorry, um, wildlife markets continue to be used uh, worldwide. And so therefore, the trade in wildlife continues to be a threat for emerging viruses. So we need to protect ourselves somehow. But tackling infectious diseases requires many things, not just immunity. We are lucky to have new methods of surveillance. We are able to sequence or identify new pathogens or new causes of disease very quickly using just handheld devices. We have new preventative measures, and we will talk about vaccines throughout this talk. We have new diagnostics. Diagnostics which are able to not only identify, but determine the antibiotic susceptibility of different pathogens. Just a few years ago, we used to use culture, and this would take days in order to derive results. And also, we now have new therapeutics, new drugs to tackle infections, including drug-resistant infections. So we're making progress in preventing pandemics all the time. This ta talk will focus a little bit on vaccine technology, how we are supercharging the immune system to protect ourselves against not just infection, but many other diseases. And of course, the Nobel Prize in 2023 went to some of the early work uh, that was directed towards mRNA vaccine technology. So how do we generate immunity against infections? We have two types of immune cells in our body. One type of immune cell is there to protect us against everything. It is non-discriminatory. It cannot differentiate 
uh, specific pathogens. If they're activated, they will just um, uh, generate a lot of uh, inflammation. This is what we call the innate immune uh, side of the immune response on the left side. This gives a rapid response for any infection. But this type of response does, ha has no memory. It cannot learn anything each time. So the other side of our immune system is one which can learn. And it can be trained in order to protect us from unknown pathogens. And this side of the immune system involves antibodies and killer cells. So how does a vaccine work? When we are infected with a, a pathogen or a virus, our cells produce antibodies. When the infection is gone, those cells go to sleep somewhere in the body. The next time the, vi the virus comes, those cells are reawakened. What the vaccines do is create these memory antibody responses without being infected. So we can protect people from an infection which does not yet exist. That is the theory about vaccinations, to produce protection without infection. So, of course, we can deliver vaccines with injections, or we can use now nasal delivery uh, to inhale. We are providing pieces of the virus or pieces of the bacteria to the body. And these pieces generate antibodies you can see in the middle there in green. If the patient encounters the disease later on, we have these sleeping cells which can reactivate to generate antibodies very fast before we become sick. So this is how vaccination works. This is obviously much more complicated. This is a diagram showing you what is happening in the lymph nodes. The, and the vaccines work in our lymph nodes, in our glands in the neck, under our arms, and all throughout our body. We have special structures where antibodies are generated after vaccine and after natural infection. The important thing is that our immune system can also learn. It is able to change over time. The antibodies change over time to become better and better and better. This enables the body to also evolve just as the virus is evolving on the outside. So we, have, we, are, um, we are specialized in evolution as well in terms of our immune system. So you can see it's a very complicated process. So how can you make a vaccine? Let's talk about mRNA vaccines because they are one of the big advances in the last 20 years. Many traditional vaccines are made up of virus proteins which are injected inside a person, as I showed you. These proteins, these are building blocks of the virus or the bacteria. For example, spike protein, envelope protein, nucleocapsid. These are chunks of the protein of the virus. We can provide them in a vaccine. But there is a limited amount of protein. And proteins are quite difficult to manufacture in a factory. They require a lot of uh, uh, quality control, and uh, they are time consuming. mRNA provides the body with the code for the virus protein. And the body will then make the protein itself because it receives the code. The advantage of providing the code is that the body is very good at manufacturing proteins. Each of our bodies is manufacturing proteins every day in very large quantities at very high quality. And therefore, mRNA vaccines are leveraging or using the human body's ability to generate proteins. It also enables vaccines to be made much faster because this mRNA code is very easy to make in the laboratory. So we can make a vaccine very fast in response to a new danger. mRNA is simple in theory, but more difficult in practice because RNA is a code. It's a sequence that makes a protein, for example. However, the human body is designed to detect RNA viruses. So many viruses which infect us use RNA as their code. So the human body has evolved 
to recognize and defend itself against viruses. Therefore, we have to trick the body, we have to fool the body into believing that the RNA code is from a human cell and not a virus. Therefore, we have to modify the RNA in very complicated ways. This is why RNA vaccines have taken 20 or 30 years to develop, because we had to figure out how to make the RNA code invisible to our body so that we don't generate inflammation in response. So a lot of changes have to be made to the RNA to make it work. Second problem for RNA is that it's very fragile. It will break. So we have to design a delivery system. And therefore, mRNA vaccines, they, form a, they provide a lipid or a fat layer around the RNA inside to protect that vaccine delivery mechanism. This also took many years to develop. So now you have the code inside and you have a protective shell. This protective shell also enables the RNA to get inside human cells. Because mRNA vaccines have to deliver the code into the relevant cell type. These relevant cells are called antigen-presenting cells. They are white blood cells in the human body which are traveling around from place to place. Their job is to sample and do surveillance for pathogens which are invading the body. The vaccine will be delivered inside those cells by injection. Once you inject the vaccine into the arm, it will find these cells, and these cells will make the protein to show the immune system what the code is of that virus. So all you need is the code of the protein. And because of this, we can make vaccines through mRNA technology for many different pathogens, influenza, SARS, Zika, rabies, Ebola, RSV, HIV, and malaria. These are all potential vaccine candidates that we can address with this platform, hopefully relatively quickly. Of course, all of the vaccines that are made in this way, they still need to undergo large clinical trials, and that is where time take, it takes time and money uh, and investment. So the technology now is relatively easy. Now the practice in clinical translation is the more difficult uh, aspect. What are the alternatives for vaccine platforms? I showed you mRNA because it's new. It's, uh, uh, it's very, very flexible. But there are other approaches. For many years, we have taken advantage of viruses as very good delivery systems because viruses themselves contain genetic code. They have a method for entering cells and for generating immunity. So we can now engineer different viruses to provide different proteins or codes to our body. So we can take a common cold virus, let's say, something called adenovirus, and we can change the code to, to provide a code for another pathogen. For example, SARS, Ebola, or Mpox. We can provide the code for one small part of that virus. We can inject this virus into the human body. It will generate an immune response against the specific sequence which you have provided. So this is an alternative way of provided, producing a vaccine. The manufacturing is a bit slower because you have to genetically make the sequence to insert into the virus and then you have to check that the virus that you make is um, viable and it correct, contains the correct sequence. The advantage is that you are delivering a real virus to the body, and so the body is really having to fight a full pathogen infection. During COVID-19, we were able to uh, mix these vaccine types to demonstrate how good they were with each other, and in fact, we found that homologous RNA, mRNA vaccines, two doses of RNA, was similar to giving uh, a virus vaccine plus mRNA. And this was also similar to giving two vaccine doses at the bottom. All of them were producing uh, um, uh, uh, immune responses that were very good. So we had two options, at least two very good options for COVID-19 vaccines adenovirus technology, such as the AstraZeneca vaccine, Johnson & Johnson, 
and of course mRNA vaccines such as Pfizer or um, Moderna. But once you make the vaccine, how do you check? Uh, how do you know this vaccine is, going, is working in a human? During COVID-19, we had to do a lot of testing. Once we give the vaccine, we have to know if the body is making antibodies. We can use very simple systems in the lab to mix blood from people vaccinated with the virus in very small wells. And then we can measure how well those antibodies are blocking infection. We can make graphs like the one on the right to show you that uh, second dose uh, uh, vaccine gives low responses against Omicron variant. But after boosting with three doses, that response is improved. So we have now technology to measure responses in, uh, in humans. So having a good vaccine is not enough. We need a, a method for measuring responses. What about use in um, uh, beyond infectious diseases? I already showed you mRNA technology can have uh, very wide-reaching implications. But there's something even more exciting here. The immune system not only uh, prevents infection, the immune system is also critical in stopping cancer. Cancer is responsible for one-third of all deaths in uh, industrialized countries. Cancers are controlled by the immune system because they produce foreign proteins. They produce mutated, abnormal proteins. Therefore, mRNA technology is now being used to generate vaccines against different cancers. And those vaccines are now in clinical trials. We can take this even further. There are plans for mRNA vaccines to address even more widespread diseases, such as genetic problems, uh, L, um, uh, dementia, vascular diseases, cardi cardiovascular diseases, as we realize that the immune system has a critical role to play in all of these disease processes, which we typically see as chronic diseases or non-infectious diseases. This brings the intersection between infection and immunity and uh, chronic disease into a single paradigm where we are now able to potentially manipulate immunity in order to prevent uh, uh, not only pathogen-related disease, but also uh, diseases such as uh, neoplasia or cancer. I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, I'd like to take questions if there are any. Thank you. We'd like to urge our audience members to use this platform to ask questions. So really encouraging you all. Please feel free to raise your hands. Our team member will come to you. And I'm sure we'd like to use this opportunity to connect with Dr. Ravi Gupta. He's traveled all the way to be with us. So please feel free to raise your hands and let's learn together. Can we have the microphone for sir, please? I am Dr. Ahmad Qasim, a senior registrar in internal medicine. Yeah. One thing is and mentioned in the media that is not real in the biology of human. That is, the virus is killed by antibodies. Mm. You and me both know that the virus killed by cell-mediated immunity. Yes. Now, nothing mentioned in the media about this method, how tested, how effective, and the efficacy of the vaccine that used to kill this virus. Yep. So can you mention to us the method to detect how the vaccine is effective using this pathway first? Yep. Second, how is the efficacy of the vaccine using this method, what happened? Why the uh, vaccines made by Pfizer and Moderna, it was mentioned at the beginning yeah. that kill 91 or effective more than 91 percent. 
then we discover yes. they are less than 80 yeah. percent what happened in, in the in the reality okay and what is the result of why they don't know to use the pathway that detect the cell mediated immunity yeah why so um i can show you oh maybe i can't okay so good qu very nice question um One second, here we go. So quest the question is, uh, I, I talked about um, uh, antibodies at the top, uh, and my colleague is asking, what about cell-mediated immunity? So yes, uh, for the purposes of simplifying, I did not discuss um, the fact that vaccines also generate something called cell-mediated immunity, right? So when a vaccine is delivered, the immune system makes antibodies, but it also makes special cells which can recognize specific proteins of virus in an infected cell, and it can destroy the infected cell to prevent transmission of the virus to other cells. We know that one cell in a day sometimes can make thousands of new viruses. So if you can kill one infected cell, you can then very effectively prevent disease. And so cellular immunity is actually very important, we believe, in, uh, in protection from infection, okay? It's more complicated because of the biology underlying it, um, but specifically CD4 and CD8 T cells are very important for this arm. And in fact, there is a relationship between the two sides. These are not just two different things. Cellular immunity also helps antibody production in the germinal center. If I show you this slide here again, uh, this is what's happening in the uh, follicular, in the germinal center, in the lymph nodes. You can see here, the B cells which make antibodies, they are talking to the T cells down here. So the B cells that make antibodies have to get some kind of help from T cells, which are um, uh, the cellular parts of the Im Im immune arm. So yes, all the vaccines all vaccines generate T cell responses as well as um, uh, antibody. And we showed this in our lab and many people showed this. But the question is what about protection, I think. You said protection, okay. So many studies were obsessed with or focused on antibody-mediated immunity because we can measure neutralization in the, in the experiment I showed you. The reason we, we spend a lot of time on antibodies is because we can do experiments like this to check antibody responses in blood. This is quite easy to do. Uh, if you want to check T cell responses or cell mediated immunity, it is more difficult. And therefore, uh, correlating the response to protection becomes more problematic. Many studies showed that better neutralizing antibody response here, so if the number is higher, the protection is better. So in green, we have very high responses. Many studies show that if you have high responses, your chance of being infected with COVID-19 was lower. Because antibodies are a first barrier to infection, the antibodies are sitting in the nose, in the throat. When the virus comes in, they are ready. Therefore, the higher the level of antibody, the more protection from infection you get. However, protection from severe disease, protection from death, probably requires cell-mediated immunity, cellular immunity. Because once the infection has come on board and you have virus, you may need not just antibodies in order to clear the infection. So both arms are important. That's a really nice question. Thank you. There's one question here, here, and a few. Um, hello. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Gupta. I really enjoyed your talk. My question is uh, regarding the mRNA vaccination technology. Um, do you think that it's a shortcoming of the technology itself where we don't have long-lasting immunity? Yeah. Or is it because of the virus itself, which is the COVID-19 yes. strength, that we required multiple boosters yes. in order to you know, uh, boost our immune system yeah. to fight against the infection? Yeah. Uh, and what's going to happen in the new 
uh, targets, which is the, the, the vaccine uh, clinical trials that you mentioned yes. earlier. Uh, do you think it will be the same uh, shortcoming where we require multiple boosters? Yeah. Um, you know, when we looked into the conventional vaccine technologies, we don't typically have it. Like, we required boosters every six months or so yes. during COVID. So I just want to uh, pick your brain and yes. see if you got to Really, that. great question. It's a very, very nice question. Um, so the question is, uh, about uh, boosting. Why do we need boosters? Can we turn the thing down? Oh, it's there. Oh. Okay, sorry. Very important question on boosters. Okay, so. The, the reason we have boosters is for COVID. You can see, uh, I'm showing you the responses against Omicron virus. So the reason we needed boosters in SARS is because the virus was shifting, changing so much. And we needed, and one way of overcoming the genetic change is to make more antibody. So that's why when you make more antibody with the booster, it seems to have a better response against Omicron, even though the booster was made against an old virus. And that's because of the mutation happening in the, visa, in the, in the germinal centers. Where is it? Here. One of the things which is happening here is, is this round one, round two, round three, round four. The antibodies are improving all the time and becoming broader. That is why you can use an old vaccine to tackle a new pathogen, but you need higher doses and repeat boosting to stimulate this round of maturation. So we used it for COVID very successfully. Do we need it for other infections? Maybe, if they are not mutating so fast, we can, we can only give one or two doses, it's enough. For cancers, we know that cancers also can mutate very fast. So the cancer may start escaping and doing something like the virus, uh, but we have no data at the moment. But we hope that the number of doses of RNA vaccine or any vaccine should not be too, too high. Maybe just two doses will be enough. And then to check response, if there is relapse, maybe you need to give another dose or a different vaccine or a different therapy. So I think it's a great question. We don't know at the moment. It's natural for antibody levels to fall over time because if we, if we maintain high antibody levels for every infection, we, we, we will have problems. We have, yeah, we'll have viscosity problems in the blood, I think. So that's why we develop a method for declining antibody, but the memory cells are still sitting in our glands, waiting. Thank you. If, if uh, you yeah, last question. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Gupta, for the talk. Um, quick question. When we are producing mass amount, mass production of the vaccines, um, while talking about the COVID vaccines, is there any decline in the quality uh, when they are mass produced, especially when they were produced all over in different parts of the world during the pandemic? Um, yeah, it's a nice question. I think that mass production of vaccine did happen in v many different countries, but WHO had a system for accrediting the, the, fa the, the production facilities for those vaccines. And from my knowledge, all of the WHO accredited vaccines had to go under, uh, undergo regular quality testing. So whilst I cannot say 100% that the quality was the same everywhere, if, if countries were following WHO um, uh, processes, then they should have been of, 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 of good, good quality. Sorry. One more? Maybe one, one last quick question. One more? <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor. 
since we in Health Innovation Week, I would like to uh, ask you to elaborate more on where do we stand in terms of uh, HIV vaccines uh, up to, to this day. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. I couldn't have placed any better questions myself. So the, the, my field is HIV uh, originally, and the uh, question is, why do we not have an HIV vaccine? And uh, it's partly due to the biology of the virus and partly due to how you get infected. So uh, H HIV has generated a massive diversity since it came into humans. So now throughout the world, we have different types of HIV. Each of them is different. And therefore, if we use a vaccine, what is the vaccine based on? Which strain are we using? What we have realized is when we use uh, strain B, for example, we do not protect against, protect against strain C. So we have a problem of making a vaccine which is broad enough to cover the, the genetic variation. The second problem is uh, when we think about the transmission route uh, of being, if you have sexual transmission, it only takes one virus to cause an infection. And therefore, you have to stop um, uh, and, and of course, one single infected cell leads to lifelong infection. The body cannot clear the virus. So this is different from COVID-19, where if you get infected, the vaccine just has to stop severe disease. The vaccine does not stop infection, but the vaccine will stop you becoming very sick. In HIV, if you do not stop the first infection, if you do not stop the infection, then you will have a lifelong infection. You cannot clear it and you will need treatment, otherwise there's, you, know, you, you develop AIDS. So the problem with HIV is that you have to stop every infection event with your vaccine. So you have to have many, many antibodies at very high concentration, many, many protective T cells, all in the relevant mucosal areas where your infection is happening. So it's a problem of delivery, of generation, of uh, a relevant quantity of, of protective antibodies to stop you know, every infection event. Remember, of course, when the virus infects your body, your cells, it can then go to sleep, and then it can travel to another part of the body and then expand. So the virus is very clever at hiding, and that's the other problem. So uh, do we uh, keep our hopes in the middle? Not too I, high, not too low. Yeah, I, I'm not hopeful for HIV vaccines at the moment. All right, but we have very good drugs, so this is one good thing. We have good prevention as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.